So let's let's pray, everybody. Um, Father, we thank you for a beautiful couple of days, and we thank you for the glory of your creation around us. We thank you for time spent with family, and we thank you for time tonight spent with you and with each other, just listening and opening your word together. And so as we listen to Mark and uh, tonight, we pray for him that you would give him the words to say, uh, the words to speak, that you would strengthen him and enable him just to share with us tonight and open our hearts to hear from you this evening, Father God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hand it over to the boss. Well, good evening properly, everybody. It's lovely to see you all uh, at week three of the Divine Blueprint uh, Bible study series. And just a wee word of encouragement. Uh, I know we're small in number, uh, but we do have a wider community of people that uh, are afraid of coming live onto our Zoom, uh, but watch the recording of our Bible study antics later on in the week. Uh, and, and one wee lady I was talking to said, you know, Mark, Rector, I'm afraid of making an agent of myself in front of everybody. Uh, to which, of course, my reply was, you needn't worry. I make an agent of myself every week on Zoom at the Bible study and we get on fine. But uh, I want you to be encouraged that it's not just us. We're here and we have the wee live conversations, but we're joined by a goodly number of folk uh, who are part of our Bible study fellowship and really enjoy uh, your contributions and your questions and discussions uh, and take a lot from that. So I wanted just to, to give that wee reminder and that wee encouragement to us all uh, as we enter in. We are a wee family uh, together joining live around this Bible study, but there's a bigger group of us uh, who watch the recorded version. Uh, if you have a Bible handy as we make preparations, uh, it would be good if you would take time to look up the famous Old Testament book of Esther. Now, if you're like me, you'll not know where it is in the Old Testament, and you'll have to look up the page number. Uh, so uh, don't be ashamed of that uh, and, and find it uh, and take your time. That, that's where we're going to be uh, this evening. We only have time to read two short uh, excerpts from the book of Esther. Uh, and I would encourage you at your own speed uh, to read the fuller text uh, to get the bigger picture. And uh, uh, it's a remarkable story uh, of uh, a remarkable group of people at a remarkable time of history uh, for God's people. Now, having, having established that you've got your finger or thumb in the book of Esther, I want to ask you a, a, a deliberate, if not slightly controversial, question. Uh, just to get our appetites whetted and get us into the context of the people we're going to meet. Uh, and that is, uh, have you ever watched a Miss World beauty competition on TV? So Carol's saying yes. Ronnie's saying no. Derek, come on, what are you, what are you, you're smiling enigmatically, Derek, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what that means, you can unmute yourselves for this wee bit, folks. I, I've watched Miss Congeniality. That doesn't that's, count, that's Sandra Bullock I've movies should be to, banned immediately that's from the closest I've gotten TV. to Miss World. <laughs> can, can, can you actually hear me? Yeah, can hear you now, Derek, go ahead. Yeah, no, um, yes, I've watched it many times as a youngster. <laughs> ah, very good man, Derek. Honesty is terrific. Terrific. Uh, what about Jim and Sarah's probably yes. slightly too young. Sarah might have, might have, might have been but stopped yes. before Sarah I'm was. In the same situation as Derek. You're slightly too young, Jim. Is that what you're no, saying? No, I'm the same, same <laughs> as Derek. <laughs> the same as Derek. Uh, Richard, what age, about you? I, I thought there would have been some kind of moral big, big brother in Kalibaki that would have blocked the TV signal to every household 
uh, you well, know, I never watched no, the no, youngster. Like, just like that, <laughs> just like that. that I, 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 I remember Bruce. I remember Bruce Forsyth's wife. Yes. There you go. Yes. Yeah. There that's you a, go. That's a good yeah. fact. That's a good, good fact. fact. Good fact. So it's 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 a it's a peculiar thing. It was an uncomfortable program. You know, maybe started off innocently enough, but but as it as it maybe increased in popularity and as it increased in in global availability, I suppose the the uncomfortable nature of of that program especially against the rising background of equality legislation uh, and, 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 and ladies' rights, women's rights, and it very quickly became castigated as a very negative uh, programme that, that had very little to offer uh, the modern world uh, that was trying to, to close pay gaps and... Uh, and job availabilities, uh, and I did seem to sit uncomfortably uh, in in that mix of, of of politics and cultural development. Well, why why do we introduce a Bible study uh, of, of a book in the Old Testament by references to Miss World? Well, really, because when the story of Esther begins, she is a contestant in the Miss World beauty pageant of her day. Uh, the background, before we read some of the early verses of chapter two, is uh, the Persian Empire is dominant. The people of God have been scattered throughout the Persian Empire. And we are in the days of, uh, in his common name, King Xerxes. Some of the people of God have drifted back to the promised land to try and begin to rebuild it. But there are many, many communities of Jews scattered around the major outposts of the Persian Empire. Mordecai, yes. uh, Esther's uncle, and Esther uh, find themselves as Jewish folk in exile in a great central Persian uh, district. Uh, the king's wife has acted the feminist. I'm going to be quite provocative here. She is called Vashti, and you'll meet, you'll read what she gets up to, and it doesn't work well because uh, she is sacked as queen. She is deposed, and the Xerxes is left without a queen and a, a kind of, I suppose, what we would call, cruelly, a trophy wife. I was going to say the word Donald Trump at this stage, but then my lawyers told me that that may not be a good analogy to put out live on Facebook. Uh, so if, if you don't see me for a few decades, you'll know what has happened. Uh, and so we come to chapter two in the book of, of Esther, and with that background in place, we pick up some of the story. And I'm just going to, to read out from chapter 2, verse 1, through to chapter 2 and verse 8. So do please follow along, everybody. After all these things, when the anger of, I'm going to use Xerxes, not that big long name, that is who he is. When the anger of King Xerxes had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the capital, under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women there. Let ointments be given them, and let the maiden who pleases the king most be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. 
Now there was a Jew in Susa, the capital, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The maiden was beautiful and lovely. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many maidens were gathered in Susa, the capital in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in the custody of Haggai, who had charge of the woman. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, there you are, folks, uh, not so far away from our apparently ridiculous opening question about Miss World. Here is poor Esther. Not only has she been already plucked once from her family, because you'll notice from those verses she is an orphan, uh, but she has been plucked like every other Jew from her homeland, promised of God to a foreign country. And now she is plucked once more uh, into this really cruel beauty pageant for a new queen to replace Vashti. Now, there is an extraordinary beauty regime. Ladies, you might be interested in this, and maybe gentlemen, uh, that it was going to take 12 months of a luxury spa treatment before Esther would be considered fit enough to be shown to the king. Uh, and it's, it's incredibly laid out in the verses that follow uh, in chapters two and three. Uh, and it, it makes such extraordinary reading, whoever wrote the book of Esther. Uh, and there's some debate about that. Uh, obviously had an incredibly uh, central position in the court to know all of this activity. So that's the introduction to uh, our, our, our story this evening. This poor orphan, uh, plucked into this competition against her will. Now, I suppose just to allow us to breathe a wee moment uh, and, and, and think a wee moment together, what do you imagine Mordecai's feelings to be in the middle of all of this story? And what do you imagine poor Esther's feelings to be in the middle of all of this process. Just amongst ourselves, throw out ideas, throw out, you know, reactions to coming against the story uh, afresh tonight or, 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 or being reminded of the story after a bit of time. We'd love to hear what you all think about that. Remember to unmute yourself if you, if you want to make a wee comment. So, assume these girls were taken against their will originally, were they actually, some, some of them had drowned and said, you know, who, who actually picked these girls from their families? So, I'd imagine that would be, they'd be terrified to start with as to what was going to happen, or did they actually know what, what was happening to them? That's a good good point, Ronnie. Mm -hmm. Anybody else sort of want to answer that? That good good anything jumping out in, in the text from, from Ronnie's query? Would Esther have been even more frightened because of the fact she was a Jewish girl? Yeah. And that sort of come. Yeah. I would say so, Carol. I think she would have been all at sea. Uh, yeah. and I, and I think Ronnie from from what we know, maybe not so much from the actual text in the 
the story that we've read so far, but from what we know from other historians writing about the Persian Empire and and, and the court practices uh, that that you know uh, officials were sent out from the palace across the whole of the empire to find these beautiful girls. Now, I have no doubt that in some corners, beautiful girls made sure that they were seen by these mm -hmm. officials. You know, the, the prize of being queen was quite a prize. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm equally sure that many of the girls that ended up in this process were just swept up and had no choice in the matter whatsoever. Um, and I think I think that's that's an honest appraisal, Ronnie, of, of yeah. your your question. But I think Carl's point is equally valid. You you know, in an unfamiliar land, uh, as an orphan girl, obviously well cared for by by Mordecai's family, into an unfamiliar court and into an unfamiliar, uh, you know, regime. And the, the, what what is not apparent, and again, historical background is good to know. Uh, there's only one winner in this Miss World competition. Mm -hmm. And all the losers were going back into the harem never to be seen again, never to have the opportunity of family, never to have the opportunity of a relationship with anybody else. Effectively, their life was over and they would stay there, never seeing the king again, if that one night wasn't satisfactory. So to say this was a high stakes Beauty competition is not over dramatic in the slightest. Is it not also possible, Mark? I mean, I wouldn't know enough about the culture of the time, but depending on what the culture of the time was, potentially someone like Mordecai, and not necessarily him, would actually have been quite proud of the fact that someone in their charge was chosen to become a potential queen. And I suppose that I think of that because I think of some of the programs that you see on TV about sort of child beauty pageants, even still in oh, the gosh, States, yeah. where families are driven to try and ensure that their daughter would be one of the ones chosen and the pride yeah. that they have because they get to a certain stage. Yeah. So I'm just yeah. wondering if there could have been an element of that. Yeah. You, you yeah. know, at the time, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think there are still elements of it, even in what we regard as a very civilized society today, mm -hmm. you know, going on. So, um. but I, I, well, it's a very good comment, Jim. And you're quite right in your analogy to, to your, of, of driven families. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's, that's very much within that culture that uh, of parents driving on their, 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 their son or daughter. They're, they're both. Uh, in, in those pageants. And uh, I mean, maybe one thing that's good to know is that, um, I mean, experts differ slightly, but they reckon that Esther could have been as young as 13 or 14 when this oh was happening. Goodness. Now, you, you, you know, you're not talking about a 28 year old. No. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, you're talking about uh, your know, unblemished young, beautiful virgins from across the land. And again, with cultural awareness of the ages at which arranged marriages happened in that culture, it is more than likely that Esther was a very young girl in, mm -hmm. in, in entering into this process. Uh, so there's a lot, there's a lot to comprehend, uh, a lot of uncertainty, a lot that is foreign, uh, a lot that is frightening, and uh, there, there, there's a little, there's a little verse that sort of is, is, is out of our remit. But one of the things that Mordecai advised Esther to do was to keep her heritage secret. Uh -huh. Now it will become apparent later in the story as we travel it together how vital that was. But at the stage that we are at, where the empire needs a queen and the competition is launched, Esther is spotted as a beautiful young girl and brought into the palace along with many others. 
uh, uh, and uh, Mordecai, her uncle, gives her this little bit of advice. I would imagine at this stage, it's pure survival. Yes. Uh, that, that, that is in play here. Uh, firstly, it may not do your cause any good if folks know that you are from that troublesome little tribe that uh, the Babylonian Empire has fought against for generations and now beaten them, uh, you know, and it could spell your doom. It could spell your doom. So just keep quiet and go with the flow. But it is really extraordinary beginning to our, our adventure. Uh, and it is a real adventure, uh, the book of Esther. Now we're going to jump forward, if that's okay, folks. I'm going to keep us moving because in a hot, muggy evening like this, uh, it would be very easy just to for energy levels to slump. Uh, and and uh, what I'm going to do maybe in about 10 minutes' time is I'm going to ask Emma to do a, take us off record and we're going to have a, a cold water break uh, and go and get a, a sip of cold water you, you, you stretch your legs a wee bit and come back to us because it, we can get a bit dozy in a hot evening after a hot day. But I would love you please to turn with me now to Esther chapter four. And we're going to skip on a little bit in our adventure. Having set that background, uh, I want to skip on uh, to chapter four and uh, and we're going to, to begin uh, chapter four at verse one. Uh, and really, I'm going to try and read a fair bit of the chapter. It's only a short chapter, but it's a critical chapter to get a gist of the next part of our adventure. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the midst of the city, wailing with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree came, there was a great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and most of them dressed in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's maids and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathkash, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go down to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hatash went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and charge her to go to the king to make supplication to him and entreat him for her people. And Hathash went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. And Esther spoke back to him and gave him a message for Mordecai saying, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law. All alike are to be put to death immediately, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that they may live. And I have not been called to come to the king these 30 days past. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to return answer, uh, told to return this answer to Esther. Think not that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another quarter. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go, 
gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and neither eat nor drink for three days or nights. And I and my maids will fast also as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything uh, as Esther had ordered him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to, be God. to God. Now, my friends, you can see we, we, we're kind of jumping through some of the major hoops of this story, but please do fill the gaps in yourself. So I hope that you've all spotted uh, that unbelievably, this young girl, Mordecai's niece, won the beauty competition. And she was crowned queen of the whole Persian Empire. Uh, quite remarkable uh, that someone from such low bearing would rise up through all her competitors and please the Emperor, Emperor Xerxes so much uh, that he immediately stopped the competition and crowned her queen of the empire. You'll also notice, although it's not so clear, uh, that something very bad has now begun for the whole Jewish nation under Persian occupation that brings her uncle to the gate of the emperor's palace in such despair, uh, wearing sackcloth and ashes. Haman, who is mentioned briefly in the text, has been elevated to be the new prime minister of the nation. And uh, I suppose in politics, we would say that he ran on a single ticket issue. And the single ticket issue is get rid of the Jews everywhere in the world. And he especially hated Mordecai. He hated Mordecai with a passion. And this was his clever plan, not just to get rid of the Jews, but Mordecai especially. Uh, Mordecai, very interestingly, uh, has overheard by this stage a plot to kill the king. And uh, so the king Xerxes owes Mordecai a huge debt of gratitude, a huge debt of gratitude. And that's where we arrive with chapter four of the adventure of Esther. She is now queen, but her and her whole nation are in peril. And uh, the most famous, one of, one of the really famous verses in all of the Old Testament, quoted and misquoted uh, for such a time as this, uh, at the end of chapter four of, of, of Esther, we have come across that. And Mordecai has challenged her to risk life and limb to try and rescue God's people. Now, we're going to stop there. Emma, if you would like to pause the recording. And folks, if you want to go... Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, folks, we, we just have taken a big jump forward in our story uh, where, where uh, Esther is now Miss World. She's got that tiara and she's wearing the sash uh, and, and she's she's setting about uh, all the TV interviews and opening up all the new hotels around the empire. Uh, and Mordecai suddenly, from being an orphan's uncle, now has the ear of the queen of all the Persian empire. And I suppose the question that not just this passage, but the whole of the book of Esther starts to, to continuously provoke is this. Pure fluke or God's design? Is it a pure fluke that Esther is where she is? No. That Haman becomes prime minister? That he plans to exterminate the Jews? And Mordecai finds a way to get this information to his, well, daughter, really, daughter, uh, by, by, by emotion, if not uh, family ties, is it just pure fluke 
or is there something more going on? Let's just take a step back and, and, and think about that and share concepts about that, uh, you know, from what you've encountered in the book so far and these characters in the book. What are your thoughts? What are your reactions to that uh, comment or question or almost accusation? It's a, it's a lot of flukes that maybe God takes hold of and uses for his own ends. Or is there something more going on? What do you think, friends? Could, could it be, could, could you hear me okay? I can hear you, Derek, yep. Yes, sometimes my mic seems to go up and on. But uh, if, if you look at, um, going back to the, the beauty pageant sort of thing, you, and, and even competitions now, you find judges, although they'll say they're neutral, and maybe the king when he saw Esther went, that's the girl for me. That's the and girl for me. Whatever I say goes. And everybody else can walk around and say, you know, he's the king. He he gets his choice, although it's a competition. And um, so so maybe some some of it might be a fluke. But then when you move on, and this is the bit that I like about the Bible study. I'm trying to get into what's behind the readings. Um, but uh, so it's, I'll go as far as say, maybe the king was a bit biased in who he saw and what he did. <laughs> he, liked, he liked what he saw, Derek. <laughs> he liked what he saw. And you're connecting very shamefully with the reasons that most of us young men made sure that we saw Miss World competitions when we were in our youth, sad to say. Because uh -huh. the very same reason, God forgive us all, but that's the truth. It, 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 <laughs> there's it there's bigger uh, questions there. When, when I used to watch uh, The Voice, for example, mm. and you see young children now, yeah. and people are actually saying, should they at that age be even involved in stuff like this? Mm -hmm. um, and again, then mm. it goes on and suddenly when somebody gets rejected, they can't yeah. handle it, and then it goes into a mental health issue. And Tough. Then the families say they weren't protected. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a step yeah. that could have been learned many, many years ago. It, op it opens up big, big issues. That that question, uh, you, you, you know, is it is it just you know, outside of the Esther story? You know, is, it, is this how life is? You know, does God sit back from us all and, and, and just intervenes when he decides to in the mess and the madness to get what he wants to happen? Or is there a wee bit more design and deliberateness in how God works with the world and the people in the world? It's a big question. It is. What do you think, Carl? I suppose on a good day, we all like to think that it's definitely God's design and God's plan, and he's in control. And, you know, it doesn't matter what all these world leaders or what all these politicians think. He's the one in control. Mm. And then on a bad day, we're thinking, God, where are you? Why are all these people dying? Why, you know, why is there so many in poverty? Why is there so many homeless? So I suppose depending on what we're being fed in media and how we're feeling within ourselves impacts how we think. Carol, that's so helpful. That 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 I think you've put that across really well and you know, when you add in the whole COVID-19 experience across the whole world, how many days have all of us wondered, you know, where is God in all of this? If there's a plan, well, I'm not seeing it. I, I can't see it. Um, you know, and you have those huge ups and downs and, and turmoil days wondering where is, is God in anything that you see around you. It's just, 
impossible to glimpse it even to with any amount of intellect with any amount of 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 experience or 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 uh, you, you know worldly wisdom you're just not seeing where mm-hmm. god is that you know i wonder for for esther uh you know i wonder whether that's what was maybe storming around her you know what what's going on here I, why am i you know why why am i suddenly queen what what god what is going on and now not only am i queen but you know here is this crisis looming you know that might have been a good thing well it is a mm-hmm. good thing i'm not going to want for anything the rest of my day i'm 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 a really powerful wealthy rich uh you, you know all my dreams have come true in some ways but now my uncle's shouting downstairs we're all going to die you know uh-huh. what is going on now it must have been a shattering, challenging moment for Mordecai and and his his daughter, the the, the queen, of trying and to work out what is happening. Where where is God in in all of this? Anybody else want to to, to, to chip in? Sorry, I don't want to. Was it Hallam you called this chap who wanted to get rid of the Jews? Um, the new prime minister. Yep. Hallen. Yep. I'm just wondering, could he have been the ancestor or was he reincarnated in the early 20th century in Central Europe and ended up running Germany? <laughs> had a wee moustache. <laughs> yeah. He, 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 he had a... He, he, like just, a he just was on a mission. He was on a mission, Les, and you'll read that. There's, no, there's, nothing, there's nothing spared in the descriptions within Esther... Of, of precisely what he thought about himself and precisely what he wanted to use his new office to do. And this was his number one priority. Call it ethnic cleansing, uh, you, you know, extermination, call it what you will, but that's that's what he set about. And um, you, you, you've heard of the law of the Medes and Persians. It's still a phrase that gets bandied about in our speech today, supposed to go back to this time in history and this empire that when the emperor made his mind up about something, that was it. It was written down in a law and never changed. Um, uh, There's a bit of an oversimplified version of that time of history, but this was a serious matter that that decree had gone out across the whole empire. Uh, and and uh, these folks were in dire straits, dire straits. When you, when you look at that, like that's 4,000 years these people have been trying to exterminate the Jews. Oh, they're they, haven't, they haven't managed getting rid of God's people. No. <laughs> no. And that's, a, Les, that's a, there, there's, there's a, there, you, you've stolen, you've stolen, my thunder from from the end of the study, <laughs> but it's quite it's inevitable. Yeah. That question has to be now fitted into the bigger picture. We have to read the the adventure of this orphan girl uh, and God's people and Mordecai against the background of the big picture, uh, and we're talking about the covenant that God made with His people way back in the days of of Abraham and Moses and Isaac. uh, And he promised them uh, that they would have a land, that he would be their God and they would be his people. And out of them, the Messiah would come. So all those covenant promises would be in play and in place, no matter what, up to that, you know, universal changing moment of the the son of god arriving into the world that we back read uh with our bible knowledge as as the arrival of, of jesus so you see these hugely unlikely things happening against the background of the covenantal promises of god uh, and the people of god just bewildered about how god 
is ever going to keep his promises? Has he abandoned them? Will he find a way to rescue the situation? And we're starting to see Mordecai acting more out of faith than fear. Uh, I think mm -hmm. we would agree with that, wouldn't we? Or, I mean, yeah. if he was going to act out of fear, uh, he would have gone as far away from the, to the, hills. To the, the castle as he could have done. And there's no point in shouting up there at, you know, your woman, you know, Esther. Her name means star, by the way. It also means myrtle, which I quite like, uh, you know, myrtle or star. Um, what's the point in shouting at her? She's not going to listen to me. If he was going to act out of fear, he would have been away trying to hide somewhere. Myrtle is a herb, isn't it? But he, he, that is, yet yeah, Myrtle the herb, uh, the sweet smelling herb. Uh, but he seems to act out of faith, some kind of faith. I remember he talked about don't tell anybody who you are, where you're from. And now, now he's crying out that maybe God has placed Esther in this position for a time such as this. Uh, and he really is firm with that. I mean, he uh, he calls her bluff. I mean, and she rules it all out. But if I go near my husband without permission, I, I'm, I'm a goner. Nobody's allowed to do that. Uh, but when Mordecai reiterates the seriousness spiritually and personally for, for everybody, she then acts with great courage, uh, I believe, and, and calls for national prayer and fasting for three days and nights before she dares approach the king. But it, it is a book that really starts to prompt us about how do you have faith when God seems so invisible? For these folks and all the other scattered Jews to hold on to any semblance of, of a caring God, a, a God who is faithful, God who will keep his promises, must have been extraordinarily difficult. Uh, and, and yet, and yet, uh, and you're going to have to read the end of this cliffhanger story for yourself. I'm not going to tell you what happens. Uh, and and, and uh, it is an amazing ending. Uh, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do any spoilers. Uh, you're gonna have to 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 read the rest of the chapters of of Esther for yourself to see what happens. You can You should have a clue if you've any biblical knowledge at all. You should work out uh, roughly what might might happen. You mightn't work out all the wranglings of how 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 God does uh, bring uh, a happy ending out of this mess, but. Uh, I'm not going to say any more than that, but we are, we are really forced to think about those big issues of, uh, you know, God who is hidden but not absent. And I think that's a very that, that's a very important that's a very important declaration to make here from the Book of Esther and from many other parts of Scripture. God is often hidden at a personal level, at a family level, at a community level, even at a, at a, at a national or a global level. Uh, oh. But that does not mean he is absent. Uh, and, and in the middle of even the most bizarre chaos and dire circumstances, God can still have a plan that he is going to work out in the most extraordinary fashion using sometimes the most unlikely heroes and people. The book of Esther is a, an amazing example of that. And we can think of many other times in, in history and many other characters in the Bible that would vindicate that statement. I suppose just as I, as I bring my wee input to a close, uh, and maybe have raised as many questions as answered, but that's maybe a, a good thing for a Bible study. Um, what does it mean to be the people of God who really continue to live in a kind of exile today? 
uh, and many commentators would talk about Christians living as Christians in areas of organized political persecution. Many mm -hmm. brothers and sisters in the faith today are trying to survive in such difficult circumstances. Uh, and, and God seems very hidden to a lot of those people a lot of the time. But also the, the commentators, some of the commentaries I read said, you know, about the people of God living in societies where Christianity is unraveling mm -hmm. uh, and has been unraveling for 10, 20, 30 years. And we find ourselves living increasingly like exiles in a strange land. Uh, and, and the book of Esther can both be very challenging and very comforting when you start to set it against the, the big biblical background, certainly the big biblical background of the Old Testament, a faithful God who keeps his promises in the most unlikely of ways, and then the bigger New Testament covenant that God makes with every believer, uh, that he will be with us through this life and has a home in heaven, our promised land that we're mm -hmm. trying to get to. There's a lot of a lot of food for thought and a lot of big issues in this book of the Bible um, and in Esther. And I suppose in the theme of the Bible study, we're, we're being asked to think of the very different blueprints, plans, principles that we see in the Bible, in the people God uses and the way that he uses them. Uh, mm -hmm. And here is another unique example of another a very different blueprint um, you know we had Jonah last week as an extraordinary blueprint of maybe somebody who was used by God despite not wanting to be used by God at all uh, here we have <laughs> another different blueprint again of young Esther uh, an unwitting servant of God in a most unlikely circumstance. Uh, and Mordecai, uh, a very faithful man of God in the middle of an extraordinary difficult uh, moment for God's people. But I, I'm gonna keep quiet now. I've spoken far too much. Apologies for that. Uh, please, please chip in, please ask questions, please encourage one another. Uh, please pose other things that you have seen or that you know from the book of Esther more generally, or or uh, that that you have heard others speak on this book. It, it's not a, a common book to hear sermons on or 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 studies in. So uh, please chip in, everybody, as as we uh, draw towards the, the the close of our study group. Just what you say about exiled from God, Mark, like. You cannot be exiled from God. Like Jonah tried to exile himself, but God was there. It doesn't matter where you go or what you do. God is there. You yeah. can't exile yourself from God. Yeah, that's um, a good point. Yeah, yeah. I suppose that the, the point, Les, that these guys were maybe trying to, to make uh, was as much about the experiences that we as God's people are going through, out of touch, not belonging, strange rules, strange rulers around us, new laws being passed that are very, very different from the faith we hold dear and, and the source of that faith. I absolutely agree with you that, you know, running away from God is a folly. So exile in that sense, I, I hold my hands up and say that that's absolutely right. I think these these guys commentating on it were, were, were sort of commenting on the culture around Christians that's increasingly uh -huh. being experienced by individuals and churches alike. But a very good point, Les, and I think we would all agree with that. Yeah, you actually see God. You, you can see you can see God's work. Okay. Mm -hmm. Look out your window there at the countryside. Go up to the yeah. top of Slemish and look out over the countryside 
Jasper. You've been out in the boat with me, Mark. Look along mm. the coastline. Yeah, you can see God's awesome. work there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Just in the, I, in the beauty agree. of the countryside. Yeah. I would agree entirely with what, what um, Les is saying. I, I think there are circumstances, however, where, as you were explaining, Mark, where because of the fact that the faithful had been scattered mm. in smaller numbers, there wasn't, you were living in exile and you didn't have that opportunity maybe for fellowship and strengthen your faith. And I suppose I think of that in terms of the situation we're now in, because to a great extent, many people have been scattered in terms of their faith over the last number of months. They have no yes. the opportunity for fellowship or communal worship or any of those things. Yeah. And they have, many people have been living in terms of faith in a relatively isolated environment. Yeah. Yeah. Now, some have been able to, you know, tune in in terms of, of technology and Zoom, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But in terms of that warm fellowship, that's been missing. And I suppose mm. the worry that I have is how do we bring people back out of that exile? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That it is not as easy as just saying, no. uh, as has been the case over history, that once things open up, everybody flocks back. <laughs> because yeah. people's circumstances have changed. So I think, you know, what we're thinking about today has a great resonance, yeah. uh, you know, with, with life today. And yeah. with what we're likely to face, face yeah. as a Christian church over the next number of months. How yeah. do we get people back out of accent yeah yeah they, they, they yeah. still have not they're still not away from god they're still probably their, their personal faith is probably still still strong but how do we bring them back out of exile into a closer fellowship and yeah. that yeah i don't th i don't think that is going to happen automatically i think I agree, it's, it's going to happen with the bishop issuing a decree that or a statement that says right churches are open you don't even have to book everybody can come along yeah. It, won't, it won't happen automatically. Yeah. Won't. yeah. You know, there's an enormous challenge for us today as a Christian church, for us yes. as a parish, in terms of how we bring the people who have been in exile, because we've all yeah. been exiled from each yeah. other for, for so yeah. many years now. So. Yeah, no, I agree, Jim. I think it's a very good point. I have sort of an image burned in my head from some maybe mad dream in the early morning of you know, that moment in a graduation ceremony where everybody throws their hats up into the air. Yes. It's a Christian congregation and we all throw our masks up in the air. Yeah. As uh -huh. a kind of a, a liberation. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. An act of liberation from, from everything that has been so much mm. part of our restricted mm. experience of faith and, and fellowship, you know. Uh, just of that image in the back of my head, it never yeah. happened because I've been entirely on un unsafe. And Ronnie's having a canary there <laughs> about how you would do a risk assessment <laughs> for such an event. Uh, you, you know, inside St Patrick's or inside Ballyclug or St Columbus, I, I don't think that would pass muster, Ronnie. Uh, but Jim, a very, I think that's very well put. I think you're right. There are exilic tendencies and exilic experiences mm -hmm. right up into the modern yeah. modern day and, and in the same way as these folk scratched their head and thought what is God doing how, how is God going to bring us back from this how are we going to survive you know uh, an Esther question how are we going to survive I think those are those are very similar questions to, to those we will be asking and have started to think about, Jim, mm. uh, and, and, and will develop in the months and the next year or two as we as we really see yeah. the impact of this. Of this yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm good. And one final thing, and th this is this is a wee bit of trivia. This would be good for your, you know, for the, all the quizzes we will have in the future, yeah. when we can have such a thing, and not a Zoom quiz, but a real quiz. Uh, the initiation of 
uh, the 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 great Jewish festival of Purim, P U R I M. It happens in 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 the Book of Esther near the end of the Book of Esther, and it is a religious festival that is practiced by Jewish people to this day, uh, and it's got some quite unique qualities to it. But basically, it is it, it is born out of uh, the need for exiled Jews to realize that they are still in God's plan and that they are still the people of God. There was a great fear that they somehow had been forgotten about. And only those back in Jerusalem, only those who had made their way back to Israel were the true people of God. And these scattered uh, Jewish folk no longer counted. And out of that great soul searching, uh, a, a religious festival began uh, here at the end of the story of Esther and Mordecai and Xerxes, uh, that is known as the festival of Purim. Uh, and to this day, Jews celebrate that. And you can get the hugely contemporary nature of that religious festival you know, just because we're not living in Jerusalem, in Israel, are we really Jewish people? Are we real? Uh, do Are we still God's people or not? So uh, there's still a, a great modern day searching of that and still a great modern day emphasis put on that festival in contemporary Jewish culture. And it's practiced all around the world and its roots are at the end of, of this wee book of the Bible. But folks, thank you for joining in. Uh, time has more than beaten us. I apologize for that. Uh, well done on this hot, sticky day for, for staying with us in a, in a complicated uh, story and adventure. Uh, there's much, much more that I wish we could say, but I do encourage you to read the wonderful, the wonderful uh, climax and wonderful um, culmination of uh, of, of the story that we've begun to look at. Um, it's the only book in the Bible that God has not mentioned once, once in. Not once. Uh, but it's an extraordinary book of the Bible because you see him everywhere in the way that it is written and the way the story unfolds. It's quite, quite uncanny. Uh, I hope I've ignited a wee bit of a hunger in you to, to be more familiar with Esther and her adventures and how this little part between God and his people comes to a conclusion. Folks, I'm going to hand back to Emma uh, to knock us off recording. I don't know which order this happens in, to pray and then knock us off recording or knock us off recording and then pray. Emma, you're the boss now. So I'll, you you take us home. I'll pray and then I'll and then I'll um I'll knock off the recording. Let's pray. Um, Father, we thank you for this time together, and we thank you for how you reveal yourself in your word. And we pray that what we've heard here tonight about Esther and Mordecai and all the uh, those in this book, Lord, we pray that it would continue to speak to us. The things would continue coming up in our minds and in our hearts and in our souls in the next few days. We ask your blessing for each one of us as we go off into our separate lives and we pray you would bring us safely together again soon. And we pray these things in your son's name and by your spirit. Mm. Amen. 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 Amen.